Um, so uh, what I'm going to be talking about today is sort of a, a combination of things that we've probably most of us have been reading about over the last few months, uh, some information that I'm able to share publicly, a few hypotheses and some reading of the tea leaves, um, and a few guesses. And I'm actually hoping with the speed that things are moving along in this area that half of what I say is going to have exciting updates before the weekend is out. So uh, if you have like things to share based on what I'm saying, please like bring it on. I would love for half of this to be out of date before long. Um, before I start, I want to talk a little bit about the end of last summer when I had just been hanging out, taking a break from work for a while. I'd been chatting already at this point with my uh, new friends at Adobe about coming on board and taking over for my uh, David Lemon, who had been running the type team at Adobe for 30 years. Um, they were not able to tell me everything that they were working on because I wasn't an employee yet. I wasn't locked down with the sea of NDAs. Something was clearly up. I was veiled references to things would come up periodically. And I wasn't exactly sure what was going on until I was hanging out at home following the Twitter coverage from A Type I. And I immediately had this reaction, like this vast new subject matter that I, you know, I'd, the conversations leading into these concepts had been happening for a while, and I'd had many, but I realized that I was going to be working with colleagues who were much more technically proficient than I am, uh, much more talented about many things, and I was going to have to help them get lots of this done. So it felt like immediately when I started in September, it was like going back to graduate school. There was so much information to take in and digest very rapidly so that I could help get more of it out and participate in what's going on. So in some ways, this talk even feels like a very casual literature review of my first semester or two of uh, dealing with all of this. So as I said, a good chunk of this will probably be out of date as different people over here share their announcements about what they've been working on. And I think that's great. And that's part of what's very exciting to me about all of this is that these very big ideas that a lot of people have been contributing to have been moving very, very quickly. And it's a lot to stay on top of, um, especially if the technical aspects of this are not what you are most interested in about working on typeface design. But What's really nice for me is that there's a community of people who are participating and sharing the knowledge, which is a pretty major shift to all of this. This collaborative nature of how this subject of variable fonts has been happening is really refreshing to me after being around the design industry for many, many years. But it's also encouraging because there are so many points of entry, so many places where you can take your own spin, your own interest in type, and find some way to interact with all of this and some contribution that you may be able to make or something to learn that interests you very specifically. So uh, part of staying on top of this, particularly within my position at, at Adobe, has been learning how to say some of these things very rapidly to help people understand what the big ideas. We can have other conversations about things. And a family in a file is about the most condensed way that I've been able to describe it so far. Um, I don't think this information is new to anyone in the room, but it's worth noting how often these, these basics have to be stated to people who are not like right down in the weeds in it. Um, these are big ideas, and it's one thing to say, it's a family and a file. You can have the equivalent of all these fonts in one thing. But the complicated part of that to explain to most people is how big a shift this is in, uh, in the mechanisms of dealing with fonts. Um, and it's part of... It's part of the complication of explaining to people why there's not things happening just yet. If you're a designer, you can't immediately begin playing with variable fonts anywhere you want. Um, there's work being done at most levels of the platforms we work in, the software that we're going to have to work in. Um, and this is the less exciting part of the message after all of the possibility of what may be there. So a quick overview of what's been happening so far. Um, a lot of people who are passionate and who are very, very skilled and very knowledgeable are coming together and contributing different ideas, different pieces of knowledge. Um, 
for the benefit of everyone. And I think this is a really big thing. And the fact that it's being captured with what is still a moving version of the OpenType specification is useful. Uh, there's not this mystery about what's going on. There are lots of mysteries spiraling out of it, as we figured out. But um, I think it's really quite nice that uh, this spec document um, has already been revised since September, and it will probably be revised again before long. Um, it's good to see all of this getting captured. Um, there's been a lot of development in the production tools, and there's still lots and lots of work to be done on the production tools. Um, I think if you've been working in variable font so far, uh, like me and like my colleagues, you may think of it as a lot of tinkering and trial and error and catching more and more things yet to be dealt with as we really uncover all of the issues that have to be looked at fresh, considering some of the implications of the technology. But happily, uh, again, these are being handled as public projects um, in many respects. So there's opportunities to contribute, to quickly iterate, um, to move things along very quickly. And the same thing is happening in the web browsers that are dealing with this, which is great. I think right now, since there are not many stable places to play with web fonts, uh, it's a huge help that nightly builds of web browsers that are still in their development phase um, are iterating so quickly so that we are continuing to flesh out bugs on the font side, on the rasterizer side, on the CSS support side. Um, that's sort of the most vital platform at the moment about showing off what we can do with all of these. And I'm very, very happy that uh, people are paying attention. Um, and the work even on the website is still going on as well. It's not just ongoing development within the type world. Um, but it was nice that the CSS side of this is moving along well. Uh, they're having debates about what are the principles that ought to be sort of locked down so that there's a bit more consensus about what's happening. Um, uh, we have fairly basic tools for previewing things right now, and I hope that this space improves some more. Um, but it's part of the challenge of when you're sort of rebuilding things from the ground up. Uh, if you can't use them, it's often hard to see what they look like as you're making them. Uh, so we have some places to start. Um, the exciting thing for me about this being fairly new and fairly public and moving fairly rapidly is that people are tinkering and experimenting and pushing against the boundaries of what's going on. Um, and you know, when I'm not knee down with uh, just managing people who are doing the real work, it's great to look up and see people thinking broadly and going big and trying to figure out what is possible, what haven't we thought about yet. Um, if you have not seen the Amstelvar and Decavar projects yet, I encourage you to. Uh, it would be probably fascinating if you can corner David Burlow and ask him some questions about what he was thinking with these projects. Uh, I originally saw both of these online when they were released and playing with them in Access Praxis, and there are things that I liked and uh, got a chance to talk with David later on and realized that they are even much bigger ideas than I had even realized uh, from looking at the fonts and tinkering with them. And I think that is pretty important. What's interesting to me immediately about Amstelvar particularly was that it exposed so many axes and starts exploring the problems of how they can interact with one another. Um, the idea that some of these are meant more for uh, um, automation and programmatic interaction rather than direct user manipulation um, is a big idea that I've not seen uh, talked about much in other places, and I think it's ripe for exploration. Um, the Decavar project, which immediately looks like madness when you first see it, is really fascinating in its own right in that it is trying to look at how far can you push the shape manipulation working with the true type outlines and what can you like really squeeze out of the technical possibilities when you need to have uh, everything interpolating and being accessed dynamically rather than sort of tweaking things at the other side. The fact that they built such complex shapes and such complex interactions, uh, whoops, wrong direction. We'll talk about that in a second. But I think with, uh, I'm totally going the wrong way. It's spoiling everything. That's the thing about things happening live and moving fast. Crazy things happen. But um, 
The other thing that I really liked about this sort of uh, demo page for Decovar is this exploration of what are some of the controls for accessing things like this. Uh, this combination of sort of like clicking to get you into certain parts of the space really rapidly and then manipulating on top of that, I think is some of the challenges that are worth considering about things with variable fonts. Um, I'll be coming at this sort of again and again because it's a real, um, it's a real bee in my bonnet, but I, I keep wanting things to move past sliders. Sliders seem like the least imaginative, most basic way of interacting with the possibilities of these fonts. Um, and that does get me to Zeitung, uh, which I've been enjoying watching what um, the underwear guys have been building with Zeitung. Uh, because they're trying to also, alongside it, get past this idea of what should the control look like. Um, with the, uh, the idea of moving past sliders and just getting into a metaphor of like dials um, is a move that helps people visualize it slightly differently. Um, the, this experiment in trying to see what could happen in a desktop app is also fascinating to me. And I think that this is an area that's ripe for exploration. Um, the controls uh, for, for Zeitung that we've seen so far are really closely mapped to this design and sort of the idea for what the design is about, um, which is another compelling concept. I think it's easy to fall back into the idea of sliders because in many cases you won't know what is going to show up in a variable font. And it may change from one project to another, depending on what axes are in there, what the design concepts are. Um, and I think this is a slightly terrifying idea, like should controls be allowed to be actually tailored very specifically to fonts themselves? And what are the implications of that? But all of these experiments about seeing what else can it look like? How can we shift the metaphor and the concept of interacting with these? Uh, is exciting to see, and I'm glad to see that people are digging into this very early um, to begin exposing these questions and getting uh, other folks further down the chain to think about what may be possible. Um, I already showed the screen grab of Access Praxis before. Uh, this has pretty much become my sort of go-to place for testing web fonts. Uh, the previewing tools that I mentioned earlier, I work with Font View a fair bit, um, is very basic in its controls about what it can show. Access Praxis is where I've done most of my demoing to get people to explain what's big about variable fonts and what's different about it. Um, and I really can't thank Lawrence enough for what he's been doing. Um, and what's immediately uh, helpful about showing showing people what variable fonts are about in Access Praxis is that it just does a few things really clearly with no fuss or muss to get in the way of what this is about. When you've mentioned variable fonts to a colleague or other designers or a group of people who are not as engaged with the subject, dropping a font onto this space and immediately seeing different set of controls mapped to the axes show up and immediately doing some quick changes shown in a dynamic way is like the simplest little trick that blows someone's mind if they haven't been in there. Um, and I'm kind of glad that there are no fine typesetting controls to get away in this particular project, um, that it just shows off these most critical new ideas to people who are trying to understand and wrap their heads around the possibilities. Um, so, there are these different little projects that are helping explain what the concepts are about, that are beginning to push the boundaries of what may be possible, how we approach some of these. Um, and it's nice that they're happening early before things are set in stone. There, these questions are being thrown out at a very ripe time. Um, so the next part of this uh, is something that everyone is very excited to see. But no, 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 no. It's very premature. You're not seeing a lot of commercial um, announcements about what people are going to do because the whole ecosystem around these is so much in the, in the early stage. It is really a moment of this sort of public conversation and this tinkering. And the fact that so many people are participating in that is really, really great, but it also makes it sort of a tricky time to race ahead with the commercial side of things um, because how much do you want to reveal about your plans for doing things commercially when there's still so much possibility for the entire landscape to sort of shift around? Uh, you know, what little I've been able to glean from folks about what they're planning 
is, has this built-in notion that it's subject to change and no one really wants to play their hand too early because it may have to be revisited and rethought before too long. And I actually think that's a healthy attitude to go into this with if you are developing fonts or you're developing software or developing tools. Like, stay a little bit nimble for a while and uh, see what, what else gets figured out in case it can get wrapped in. Um, as I mentioned, there was already an update to the specifications since September when we got to 1.8.1, uh, um, but people have still been raising questions and um, raising issues about things that they've seen in the spec. Uh, so there's, there's a growing list of notes and other concepts to explore and suggestions, and I'm expecting I have no idea yet uh, when the next version of this has come out, but before long, the spec will shift again, and there will probably have to be some tailoring of the tools um, to go along with that so that people can build things according to spec and have shippable products. So it is still a moment of, you know, it's not settled down just yet, and it's worth keeping in mind uh, with the projects that we're all working on. Um, we certainly know that we need improved rasterizers, the sort of the underlying software layer that lets you see variable fonts, work with them, uh, be exposed to the potential of this. Um, everyone has been working so far with some basic capabilities baked into uh, the latest versions of Windows, uh, the latest versions of Mac OS and Chrome, um, but there is work being done in this space. Most of what we can do is dealing with true type flavored variable fonts, um, uh, my colleagues have been furiously working on dealing with a lot of the questions about CFF2, the update to the compact font format. Um, and there's a lot of fleshing out even the questions around CFF2 or like exposing other questions about how things are getting dealt with. So this, again, just the underlying methods of being able to access the variable fonts and do things with them are moving along pretty rapidly. Um, and the production tools are improving. Um, there's a lot of collaboration going on in that space and there's constant sort of fleshing out of uh, better ways to approach things. Um, and uh, part of the reason that it's hard to build shippable fonts so far is that there are still many uh, unresolved uh, things to do with the tools for making the fonts, which are moving along rapidly. Um, but again, most of this is happening pretty publicly on GitHub, and people are working on the fonts alongside of this. This is like the, the sort of the fun, showy bit. Everyone is doing experiments, figuring out how to uh, transform families that already existed, come up with new designs, really like taking into uh, account the conceptual possibilities of what variable fonts can do. Um, and it's great to see that work, and it's great to see all those questions and ideas that that pose, but again, most of those fonts are probably going to have to be revised and hopefully have new capabilities really deeply considered so that um, it becomes compelling for the people who use typefaces to really jump into variable fonts and make this whole notion a success. Um, so what I can safely talk about is some of the work that's going on at Adobe that uh, the type team and the core type teams are working on. Um, most of this is being uh, done with sort of public contributions, so it's sort of safe to talk about this. Um, the, uh, uh, Miguel Souza and Frank Grieshammer have been working on uh, what we've called for the purpose of this the Adobe Variable Font Prototype. Um, this is a, uh, a version of Frank's source serif family, um, but uh, what we've been trying to do with the prototype, which we're sharing on GitHub, is to continually build a font as closely to the spec as possible, as best as we can allow with the current state of the production tools. And so it's been a way internally of sort of trying to flush through the code and look for bugs and look for things that haven't been addressed yet, throw in some additional levels of complication to test and see how things working, post that publicly with notes about the issues so people can sort of get a, a sense of where things are and make it available to play with in the circumstances that they can. So the, uh, the prototype is available in TrueType format and CFF2 format. Um, the, there's not much to do with the CFF2 version so far, but it's really, really helping us perfect uh, the production process. Um, Miguel and uh, Reed Roberts, who works on the AFDKO tools, have been uh, 
using this project to continually like rebuild a workflow method for what we can do and then that we can sort of then recommend via how the AFTKO works. Um, some of the things that are going on in the variable, pro the variable font prototype are, um, as I mentioned back here, so it's got a registered access and an unregistered one. Um, it's also got intermediate masters, which was handy because it helped draw attention to a bug in the Cortex rendering in macOS. It's got uh, transitional glyphs, which have already exposed a couple of bugs that need to be addressed. Um, so we're trying to drop things in bit by bit as we address them uh, to make sure that we have something to check with as it goes along. And so you can get this on uh, GitHub. You can take a look at the notes, see what's there, play with it, and let us know if, if it's helping you track down anything else um, that's worth fixing. Now, so alongside of this, there is the AFDKO, the sort of the, the tools that we use at Adobe for producing fonts, and the AFDKO sort of has makes it, made its way into other production tools in the past, and right now there's a lot in the AFDKO that has to be rebuilt um, to deal with variable fonts. Um, primarily, uh, a lot of the issues about dealing with CFF2 as opposed to CFF. Um, but as of yesterday, Reed has posted the, uh, the most up-to-date version of the AFDKO that we've been working on internally. This is not complete. It's not yet ready to build shippable fonts, but it is at least stable up to the point of the address issues that we're aware of and can be done. So again, you can play with it, see it, log issues, experiment. Um, the biggest thing that uh, is missing at the moment is um, we've discovered that the auto hinter, which is one of the older, oldest chunks of code in the AFDKO, has to be rethought pretty seriously. Um, this ability to work with overlapping segments um, and overlapping contours uh, in variable fonts uh, turns out to create some complications uh, that go pretty, pretty deep into how the auto hinter works. Um, and again, this is something that we noticed working with the variable prototype font. Um, so the, the variable font version of source serif um, has a lot of over overlapping contours which help with the interpolations to get to the final shapes. And Frank built this so that, say, in instances like the H and the W, um, I can try out this fancy thing that Jurgen was telling me about. Um, if you see the difference from here to there, um, it's exposing an aberration in the hinting. Um, these are two like very, very close instances within the very variable uh, progression along here. Um, but what's happening is that in certain places in the space, the hints are not aligning of the overlapping segments, particularly where the contours are concurrent. Um, so this, this highlighted the reason that actually um, in these instances where you actually want the segments to overlap but stay very close to one another, uh, it's a lot trickier to get the overlapping hints to line up as well as the overlapping contours will do. Um, this has turned out to be a big issue with a lot of the CJK fonts um, from the, the way that the source data for our fonts have been set up. So uh, this is going to be the next few months of work uh, that's going to be happening with this. Um, there is a rough estimate from Reed that uh, he hopes this will be dealt with sometime this summer. No promises. It's all in motion. We're dealing with it as it comes along. Um, but this is the kind of thing that keeps happening over and over again with the tools. It's one thing to say in the specification, great, overlapping contours would be amazing, so helpful, so flexible. Lots of other things uh, come careening out of that one decision that have to be uh, dealt with along the way. Um, there are a couple of smaller things uh, in there that are also uh, still being worked on with updates coming. Um, the TX tool is able to write out variable fonts, but it can't handle all of the subroutinization that's possible with that, which basically means it's not able to write out the full compression that's possible within the format. Um, and there are some other language issues that need to be dealt with uh, to actually um, declare everything that's going to need to happen with the transitional glyphs. That's a thing like where the, you know, the bar in the middle of a dollar sign appears and disappears depending on the overall weight and shape of the glyph. Um, so these little, little things keep 
creeping up. We had, a, we had a beautiful plan a few months ago, being able to say, great, here's a new AFDKO today, but that just kept pushing further and further back as we saw more and more of these things creeping up. Um, and I would much rather have us, have us share a more stable version of the AFDKO and say, now it's probably better to do shippable things. This is clearly not the case now, but uh, it's been so helpful to be coming across all of these things to make sure that like, you know, there's something bulletproof on its way. Um, the AFDKO also pulls in lots of functionality from the Font Tools project. Um, um, and a few interesting things are coming out of that, and there's a lot of back and forth. Um, um, Reed has been participating to the project. He's been working a lot with Badad and the other folks contributing to that, sort of sharing ideas, trying to see like who can actually sort of come up with a more elegant uh, way of describing and coding the solution. Um, right now, kerning lookups are proving to be a little bit tricky. Um, there's still not the most stable support for, for uh, the tables that allow you to sort of plot the shape of a curve across the interpolation in the fonts. Um, uh, Miguel has been spending a lot of time thinking about the fact that there's not like a pen functionality yet. Um, the tools are assuming that you have uh, masters that you're combining and doing with work. Uh, Miguel is trying to figure out all the situations in which you'd want to draw something from scratch um, and have that um, brought into there. So there's these ongoing issues. Happily, there are very passionate people working on all of these, trying to get them happen. Um, but it's this overall nature of things are a little bit sort of slippy and slidey still. Um, uh, one of the pieces that we've been working on uh, for the last few months um, that is going to happen is that uh, the core type team at Adobe has been working with Microsoft to, uh, to give them the code for supporting CFF2 within an upcoming version of, Wind of Direct Write for Windows. Um, so that'll be nice. When that happens, it'll be easier to start seeing CFF2-based variable fonts out in the wild. Um, um, I believe that Peter is going to have a bit more to say about this later, but uh, uh, this has been sort of so like... We've been worried about whether or not we could even talk about this for so long while it was happening. I was really glad when he said, yeah, it's fine, we're ready to talk about it. Um, I, don't think, I don't think anyone is exactly sure when this is going to be out in the wild. That's certainly not for me to say. Um, but I'm glad that yet another piece is slowly falling into place in this whole ecosystem. Um, so. That's about it for what we're able to share about what's going on. This is the work, as I said, going on with the type team and the core type team who works on uh, the rasterizers, the underlying technology. But so now that I'm past the bit of this where I'm sort of saying things as a manager of the type team, I want to get into sort of some of the reading of the tea leaves and opinions about things that I've been developing. Um, and this is like not necessarily the Adobe position on stuff. This is me trying to start making sense of this so I can like see, well, what can happen next? What would it be like? Um, I care a lot about um, how people work with fonts as well as how they make them. Um, I would, being sort of less, my background as a type designer has certainly taken the path of being less technically adept than a lot of my colleagues. I just work really well with, drawing on screen in WYSIWYG environments. I'm looking forward to different UIs for making the variable fonts so that it's not just a series of text files and command line tools because they freak me out from time to time. Um, I'm also looking forward to more development in the previewing tools uh, since we still know that there's not stable environments for just generating a font and dropping it into an app or throwing it at a browser. Um, some, you know, when there's some stuff with a little bit more flexibility and capability than, say, font view, would be really, really nice uh, to get more people uh, working on the fonts uh, who deal better with the WYSIWYG-oriented side of things. Um, and I think that, aside from the making font side of this, I'm really, really eager for people to start diving into the side of, like, how do you work with variable fonts? What can you do? Um, those experiments about sort of what do the controls look like for manipulating variable fonts um, are interesting in that they're looking for better metaphors and more complex 
or more subtle versions of approaching the controls. Um, what I would like to see in the controls for working with this and sort of getting past, say, what's happened with uh, open type support over the years is I would really like to see typesetting controls that help users understand the capabilities that are being made available to them, particularly with variable fonts where a different font may be put in a user's hands with very different capabilities. Uh, how can a user wrap their head around what those axes in Amstelvar are about? How does the UI help them um, understand uh, the possibilities with the precise typeface tool in front of them. Um, and I think there are so many possibilities with what we can do with automation with variable fonts. You know, there's math underneath there, and we can access that math and do things. Um, this is also part of my, uh, my idea about trying to get away from sliders. There's a lot of that stuff that may be better dealt with by the software than by the user. Um, and I'm interested to see more and more experiments about how the tools that people do typesetting with may be able to help them um, take better advantage of what variable fonts can do for them. Um, it takes a lot of practice to understand like really how to work with things like optical sizes and grades. So like, let's help them get part of the way there if you know something about typography and making software. Um, these are some of the like definitely most not Adobe's position on things that I have to say. This is like me. Throwing out, throwing out some ideas about what I'm making of things right now. Um, I think that for a while we're going to be seeing the best thought experiments about variable fonts and what you can do with them typographically happening on the web. What, the, what you can do technically happening on the web. At the moment, it's the platform that is iterating most quickly, is most flexible to deal with. Um, it's so easy, you know, if you know a little bit of CSS, if you know a little bit of scripting. Um, this is the place where you can just like tinker, play, make things happen. And I think that's going to be the case for a while, particularly because it's not going to be particularly wise to have uh, commercial releases of other kinds of like um, apps or other typesetting tools or design tools for quite some time because we're moving so quickly on all the underlying support for all this. Um, so like look to the web, play with the web, please try to break stuff and push the boundaries at this moment when we can most easily talk about it and adapt and iterate and come to some consensus about how things should be supported and how they should work. I think it's a really, really bad time to make promises to people who uh, just want something that will work. Um, this is a good time to push back and tell people to wait, to think deeper about may, what you may want to do, what they may want to commission. Um, the, particularly because since we don't have a lot of um, application environments for using variable fonts yet, um, things could really change about what's possible with the fonts by the time applications decide what they want to do with them. Um, this is a great time for patience and tinkering and experimenting and thinking. But uh, don't back yourself up into a difficult conversation with an unhappy client just yet. Um, and this is a question that I keep getting from lots of fronts is like, is this going to work? People are very, very sensitive about variable fonts uh, being too complex for people to really want to deal with. Is it like, are you offering designers or users too much to really think about? Um, what I've seen over and over in years in talking with students, talking with customers, um, talk with all kinds of people, people want fonts to be simple and straightforward. Uh, it's why they were so annoyed about like licensing models and functional models for web fonts changing. Um, most people who work with typefaces want them to be the least complicated part about the job that they do. Uh, they're already thinking about what they want to do as designers, what they're doing as um, uh, you know, building brands, what they're trying to communicate with text. Whenever you make someone stop and have to deal with their typefaces, they kind of get a little bit annoyed because it's just grinding them to a halt. Um, so people are worried that all of the, all the potential with variable fonts um, may be for naught if people just don't decide to deal with them. And I think that's worth considering in, as we approach environments for working with the fonts. Um, but 
variable fonts are going to happen. They're going to be out there. They'll find their niche one way or another. Um, the, the possibilities that you get from the compression, from the, you know, combining so, many, so much into a design space, into a single deliverable, um, a lot of people have invested a lot of time and money in already. Um, Apple, Microsoft, Google, Adobe, all have reasons for, for really wanting variable fonts to be out there. Um, the big question is be what is going to be, what is it going to mean for the average day-to-day -day user? What can they do with variable fonts? Um, and I think that'll be the tricky question. They will exist. They will be out there. Will they spread out of this niche and become sort of like a really well-received um, tool for people to work with and designers to do. Um, I think that's where the hard work is going to continue happening in the next year or two, is making sure that people understand how awesome this is. Um, they don't get it yet. They're intrigued, but they don't really get it, and they're a little rattled. Um, and this is the... Um, this is why I get back to why I think it's so important to keep an eye on what's happening in the web, where people can iterate so quickly right now. The web is a really great way to expose people to variable fonts and expose them to the experiments um, and get designers who aren't afraid of change, users who aren't afraid of change, to say, I want that, that's cool. Um, and this is, I think, what's so particularly beneficial about us being able to tinker publicly and have these conversations. We can begin building the landscape for people to accept variable fonts and to like want to have them to work with and make cool things happen. Um, and I think that also with this, with this iteration that we can do rapidly and publicly can have a big influence on what happens on the more stable products later on that may or may not take advantage of variable fonts. Like, let's break the stuff now. Let's raise the questions now so that um, the people who are working on the stuff that has to move on sort of like a slower, more thoughtful pace actually see what people are wanting to have happen actually see what people are trying to accomplish with them. Um, I think that is like a much more fruitful way to consider what's going on now, is that you know, we, can shape, we can shape what happens with variable fonts instead of waiting for people to say, this is what you can do. Let's tell folks, this is what we want them to do. Um, and a lot of that is going to come down to the user experience. Um, we've seen what like poor user experience has done to the adoption of open type features over the last 20 years. I'm surprised at how many very knowledgeable, talented, experienced designers really don't get what open type features are. It astounds me. Um, but it's mostly been a UX problem. Um, and I don't want to see that happen again, especially not when we have something with so much potential to work about. Um, and whenever you also talk about variable fonts to people who have been in the design industry for a while, they sort of like wagging a figure about like, what's the difference from, from multiple masters? That was a good idea that didn't make it all that far, or true type GX. Um, especially when you say that variable fonts are built on some of these underlying concepts. Um, I, have n I remember working with multiple master fonts, and it was a great idea with a lot of potential, but it was a bit of a nightmare to work with. Um, and there are a lot of things about variable fonts that make them easier and address a lot of what was difficult about managing all the instances that you could output of multiple master fonts. Um, multiple master fonts had you know, slightly awkward controls that pulled you out of the design space, that you're, like, you know, pulled you out of Quark Express to go make a font, or pulled you out of PageMaker so you could tune things, and then you had to share those fonts. Um, we've also had all of these years since Multiple Masters and TrueType GX to think about what didn't work about them, and a lot of that is what's made its way back into the idea of variable fonts. Um, on top of that, there is this notion that there are people who definitely can take advantage of what variable fonts can do with the compression, with the single file that has all this fluidity in the design space, with the programmatic and animated aspects of it. So um, it's easy to say we've cracked a lot of the problems from those experiments, but they've really, these have left a mark on a lot of people. Um, and it's going to take better user experience, something that does teach people about what's possible and makes it inviting rather than off-putting or distracting. 
uh, to really help people adopt these. And I hope that goes well, because I think this is fun. I think it's fascinating. As a typographer, I'm really eager to see what I'll be able to do with all of these. Uh, as someone who makes fonts and works with people who make fonts, um, I really love to see the industry pushing past the idea that a font is a stable thing when we can treat them more like software and get the benefits of what you can do treating fonts like software. Um, I think it would be a shame if like, a piece of this puzzle didn't help us get there and didn't help people understand what's possible with all of these. Um, and please, like, let's, let's think in a better way than the slider model. Like, Let's lead people to understand what they can do. Let's be a little bit more flexible in how we'll allow them to interact with the fonts. Um, I don't know what the answer is. I don't know what a better um, model is for using this, but um, you know, people are playing with things. They're figuring it out. Let's, 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 make it, let's make it be something that helps rather than is just there because it was the thing to do. Um, and I guess we'll see from there what happens. Thank you.